I invite you to sit back, pay attention, and separate yourself from the 95% who just dream of success and come join the top 5% who actually achieve it. Achieve it. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Greg S. Reed. There was a young American author named Napoleon Hill. He was 25 years old, and he gained a meeting with the richest man of the world, Andrew Carnegie. He went over to his house, and Carnegie liked him. He says, young man, I've got an opportunity for you. If you're willing to work for me for free for 20 years, I will send you on a mission to meet the most influential and powerful people on the planet. Some of the most powerful things we can ever do are opportunities that are given to us and put on a platform. In 2008, exactly 100 years later, the president and CEO of the Napoleon Hill Foundation, Don Green, came and wrote a letter of recommendation opening the doors to go meet with today's icons and gifted me the opportunity to do so. <laughs> Think and Grow Rich, the very first chapter is about a guy named R.U. Darby. You see, he's this young whippersnapper who gets gold fever, gets all excited and goes out west. He finds a little hole and starts digging in it, and sure enough, finds a couple nuggets. Woohoo! He buries it, covers it up, and goes back home. He tells his family and friends about his discovery, and they chip in money so they could buy equipment and pull it out by the truckload. Well, sure enough, the first cart comes out, and it yields one of the largest gold strikes ever. Can you believe it? Oh my lord, they start counting their chickens. Woohoo! Happy dance, right? But all of a sudden, the gold ran out. But they kept digging and there was no more gold. They kept digging, and there was no more gold. They did this day after day, week after week, month after, and they ran out. Finally defeated, Darby walks out of that mine and says, I quit, I give up, and sees a junk man walking by. Says, hey buddy, give me 200 bucks, I'll sell you the mine and all the equipment. And the junk man realizing the equipment's worth more than that just in itself said, you got a deal. Darby leaves home a quitter. Well, the junk man, he does something very brilliant. He seeks outside wisdom than his own and seeks an engineer and says, what happened? They hit gold and they ran out. The engineer started laughing. He goes, oh my gosh. He goes, that's so simple. He says, gold runs in a vein. It's a gold vein. He goes, what they did is they hit one side, hit gold, and it came out the other. That's why they ran out. He says, just go back to where they hit their discovery. Go three feet in the opposite direction. You'll tap back in the gold vein as well and pulled millions of dollars out of that mine that fills Fort Knox today. <laughs> that story, Dave Winnegar, I asked him. I said, what was it like getting started? He looks at me and goes, man, it was brutal. The first two years, every phone call that came in was from a bill collector. He goes, I'd be so embarrassed when the phone would ring, I'd run across the hall and pick it up so my secretary wasn't put on the spot. He goes, on the third year, every letter that came in, was from a law firm threatening to sue me, call me a liar, a fraud. I go, how'd you handle that? He says, well, I took my attitude from trying to prove them wrong to prove myself right, because I knew I wasn't what they're making me out to be. He said, I called every bill collector, says, look, I don't have the 50 grand I owe you, but I'll give you $50 and a promise that I won't quit. I won't file bankruptcy. Don't give up on me, I won't give up on you. And on the fourth year, someone bought the very first franchise which came to be Remax, the world's largest independent real estate firm. And then he says, you know what, again, forget about me. I don't mean anything, but how many people's lives were changed? How many things would have been different if I would have given up? How do we know the guy who's got the cure to cancer isn't about to give up because he's three feet away from gold right now and his phone's ringing? And you ask yourself, are you right now sitting in that chair three feet away from your own gold as well? Do you want to hear another story? Yeah. I got to sit down with a guy that you don't know his name again, but you know the icon that he helped create called Hershey Chocolate. His name is Ron Glosser, ran a multi-billion dollar trust. And I asked him, I said, what's the difference between people who succeed and those who don't? He 
He looks at me and says, that's simple. Successful people never make a major life-changing decision while they're in a valley. I go, what do you mean? He goes, think about it. Everyone makes their major life-changing decisions when they get sick, they get laid off, the economy goes in the sinker, they get divorced. He goes, how can you make a positive life-changing decision based at your lowest point in life? He goes, understand this. Everything is cyclical. You have your ups and you have your downs. He goes, if you could just ride the storm out when you're having a low moment till you have a little bit of a rise, a little bit of an upswing, make a decision from that point of view, you'll save 10 years of your existence on this planet from making it at your lowest point. And I'm going to finish with just telling you one last story. One of my favorite interviews, everyone always says, who's your favorite one, right? Well, my favorite one came from the most unlikely source. You might know him in the boxing world, Evander Holyfield. You ever know about Evander? Remember, he got his ear bit off by Mike Tyson? By the way, he's an Adonis, man. That guy's a good-looking man. <laughs> he's like this big. He's just a sculpted guy, and he's missing half of his ear. And I said, let me tell you, that. did it hurt? He goes, not really. He goes, the biggest shock is that people don't know this, but Mike Tyson and I, we were best friends since we were 16 years old. All that stuff was hype. He goes, but when your best friend bites your ear off, he goes, it kind of has a strain on your relationship. <laughs> I said, well, I, that would make sense. And I asked him, I said, Evander, will you teach me something? I go, tell me, what well, makes people more successful than the next? I'll never forget this, because this is the most powerful message I think I took along the journey. He says, Greg, he goes, you got to have a higher standard. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, if you have a car and you will not tolerate it running bad or being dirty, you're going to have a better car than your next door neighbor. He goes, if you have a household and you will not tolerate your husband coming home drunk, kids being a mess, you're going to have a better family and social dynamic. He goes, in sports, I showed up early, I left late, I had a higher standard, invented new exercises, and won more championships than anyone else ever has. He goes, if you could have a higher standard in your industry, whether you're a pet groomer, a stockbroker, or you're selling some other type of product or service, he goes, I guarantee you'll have more success than those around you. Doesn't that make sense? I said, but give me something more tangible. I go, that's great. I go, but what is it that inspires you? What makes you keep going? I go, doesn't it hurt when you're getting the ring and you're getting hit? He goes, sure it does. He goes, but I have a big enough, and I heard some guy back there say it, a big enough reason why. He goes, every time I get into a boxing ring, I don't focus on that fight. He goes, if you do, you're going to end up on the backside. He goes, my competition, every time I hit them, they go, ow, that hurts. Ow, that hurts. And where do you think they end up? Knocked out. He goes, it's the same thing in life. People focus on all the blows coming their way. Oh, gas prices. Oh, it's tough out there. Oh, my boyfriend's mean. Oh, whatever. And all of a sudden, they wonder why they never go forward. He goes, when I get in a ring, I don't focus on that fight. I finish focusing on the championship. That's my only goal. And he goes, you know what the funny thing is? There's a big guy, and he pulls me in. <laughs> That's right. He goes, when you win that championship... He goes, everyone comes to their feet, and they start chanting your name. He goes, they raise your hand in victory, and someone comes out, and they put a big, shiny belt around your waist. He goes, at that moment, at that second, you never even feel one of the punches you took along the journey. He goes, but the guy in the losing locker room says he's going to feel every bruise for the rest of his life, wishing he would have made it. So many fail, but will they succeed? The ones who strike and bitch, the ones who persist, they never quit.